Well, it's good to be back. It's good to be here. Um, going away for two weeks. Uh, some of you who may not know, uh, I was privileged to go away on a two-week study tour in Egypt, Jordan, and Israel, and spend that time uh, hiking around and... Uh, yeah, this hi to my granddaughter. Yeah, a little smile for Opa. That's good. I'm good. Uh, spending some time uh, traveling around in Egypt, Jordan, and Israel. We spent uh, three days in Egypt, four days in Jordan, and seven days in Israel, uh, seeing the land and the spaces that uh, the people of the Bible walked and talked about and wrote about and lived in. And it was an extraordinary, extraordinary experience. A couple from BC in the Christian Reformed Church who have a very successful business, uh, spoke up and said they wanted to send every senior leader and their spouse on this trip for free. And you gave me the time to study and to do that. And I'm so, so grateful. Uh, Two things in general, if I could say, and you'll hear me talk a lot about this trip, but two things in general. Well, first of all, uh, it was a trip of a lifetime. Just, I cannot express to you the change that it's making in me as I see the word of God and understand the context and the geography as it comes to life. And the second thing is, I needed to walk more stairs and hills before I left. Uh, There is very little spaces in Jordan and Israel that isn't either on an incline or a decline. Uh, I walked 175 kilometers in two weeks. Um, for those of you who uh, can do that sort of thing on a regular basis, God bless you. I mean, that is an extraordinary amount of uh, time to be walking. I, I mean, I'm sitting at a desk most of the time, and in a good week before I started training for this, I'd walk 30 kilometers, right? Uh, 175 in two weeks is a lot. And over the course of those months, I, I had to up my game and I had to up my training, but boy, I needed to do way more hills than I was going to do. Uh, we were privileged to go with a tour group and a man named George DeYoung. Uh, George studied under Ray Vanderlaan. Now, that name may be familiar to those of you who are a little bit older, because back in the, the 1990s and the 2000s, a Bible study series came out on VHS tape. Remember those? Yeah? It was like magical. There's VHS tape Bible studies. It wasn't just book Bible studies. It was video And Ray Vanderland would go to these places and he would take the time to not only explain the landscape and the culture of the Romans and of the Egyptians, but explain and teach the Bible on site in those places. And our guide, George DeYoung, learned under Ray Vanderland. And so he told us in our orientation back in November last year, he says, I'm going to lead you in a different way that you're used to. Now, you're all leaders sitting in this room, and you're not going to like it as much as you think because you have to follow, and I'm going to lead. Now, anyone know me well at all? Um, I mean, that's a bit of a problem for me uh, and for many of those people in the room. There's 42 of us that went. Most of those are pastors or leaders in their church, whether they're spouses or or pastors themselves, and to be led in this way to follow the leader was quite a challenge, actually. Uh, I can sympathize a little bit now, maybe with some of the decisions we make as leaders and you not knowing where all the information is. Because every day he would tell us basically two things, where the food was at the hotel and what time to get up in the morning and what to wear the next day. That's it. Uh, We would gather in the morning, and we would do devotions together and get on the bus. And he would start every day by uh, doing the Shema. And I'm going to explain to you a little bit about what that is. And then he would follow it up with words like, come, let's go. And he would say that off and on all day long, and we would just follow. So like little ducklings following Mama Duck, we would grab our stuff and get on the bus. And then the bus would stop, and he would look at us and say, come, let's go. And we'd have to hustle and grab our stuff because he was already off the bus and walking. The first person off the bus often had to stand in front of the nameplate of the place that we were in so that we didn't even know where we were. And he said that what he wanted to do, he said he wanted to treat us not like tourists, but investments. And he said, I want you to have an experience of this place like opening a present on Sunday morning. Who puts a present under the tree and doesn't wrap it. It takes all the fun. There's, you do that? Yeah, that takes all the fun out of it, right? 
you got to wrap the present. you got to stuff it in a bag. you got to put fancy paper on top so that on Christmas morning you can open it and go, oh, wow, isn't that beautiful? I wish I got something else. No. Uh, <laughs> oftentimes, it's, it is beautiful. And he created this experience for us by not telling us what we're doing. Now, those of you who are detailed people here in the room, you're already sweating. <laughs> because if you went on a trip like that, that would drive you crazy, Right? Uh, the extent to the instructions were what to wear the next day and where the food was when we got there. Really, that was it. For 14 days, we followed the rabbi. Come, let's go. And off we went. And he would, in the middle of the time, he would stop in the middle of preaching and teaching and there's this big pregnant pause and then he would say, come, let's go. And off he went. He would take off and uh, we would have to, we, we're grabbing our stuff trying to follow him. This is my experience over those two weeks. It was a series of opening gift after gift after gift and being amazed. It was incredible. Each day, he started with the Shema. How many of you know what that is? A couple of you probably will. The Shema. The Shema is a series of scriptures, and it's really based on one scripture, that the Jewish or Orthodox Jews still today and the Jews of Jesus' day and the Jews before up until the point of Moses when he gave these words to the people is a summary of the most important thing that God wanted those people to learn. It was the most important thing that they should know about who God is. Moses has gone up into the mountain. And God says, listen to the people. And he hears the people dancing and shouting because Moses has been gone for 40 days and they create the golden calf. And he runs down and drops the stone tablets and breaks them. And he goes through this whole process of cleansing the evil. And then he has to go back up the mountain and now chisel out his own stones of the Ten Commandments. And God brings them into the glory of God and being on top of Mount Sinai and being in the place where Moses stepped into the glory of God is a story for another day. What, your appetite? I hope. It was an incredible experience. But Moses comes down the mountain and shares with the people the Ten Commandments. And in Deuteronomy chapter 5, we have a record of those Ten Commandments as they're written. And then in chapter 6, and it's not on the screen, but just listen. These are the commands. This is Moses speaking. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. They're about ready to go to the Jordan. He says, remember these words. Don't just hear them. Don't just know that I'm talking. Don't just understand them, but make them go deep into who you are. Imprint them upon your soul so that you and your children and your children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all of these decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of our fathers promised you. And here it is, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. These are the very words of God. Hear, O Israel. These two words are two Hebrew words. Hear, O Israel, is the word Shema. Hear, O Israel. Hear, Discovery Church. Listen. Don't just hear the words that I'm speaking. Don't just know that they're coming to your ears. But understand them and let them transform you. That's what he means. When he says, hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all of your strength. The very words of God. Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah. These are powerful words. These are words that Jesus spoke uh, in the New Testament. He took the very same words. And he spoke them to the uh, Jewish leaders of the day who were quizzing him on the nature of his authority. Now, when you think about that for a second, Moses spoke those words of the Ten Commandments. Moses shared the words, hear, O Israel, the Shema with the people of Israel. And every day, every day, 
every day, three times a day, they would say these words. Why? Because they were called to imprint them upon their children. And Jesus repeated them. The Bible says here, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. This is still in Deuteronomy. (laughs) Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads and write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. Being in Israel and being close to Orthodox Jews brings whole new meaning to this little phrase, these two phrases. You see, not only were the Israelites, uh, the Jews of the time, supposed to teach those words, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but they were to imprint them upon their children. If you've got children in the room here, put them in your mind's eye right now. Just think about them. The command of Moses is the same command that Jesus gives. Hear, O Israel, teach them to love the Lord your God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength your children, your grandchildren. Do whatever you need to do in order for them to understand the holiness of God. Let the very words of God speak to you. Love the Lord your God. And how are they supposed to know that? Put those children in your mind's eye and those grandchildren. How are they supposed to know the love of God? Only through you and through the people that you put into their life. That's how they'll know. The very love of God. How well do you know the love of God? You see, because I don't think you can give any more than you've experienced. I don't think that you can show your children the love of God in a manner that you have not shown, been shown yourself. And what the Jews did at the time is they started doing some things that, that actually interfered with the way in which people would experience the love of God. They took these words literally. When I was uh, in the airport, it was time for morning prayers. And an Orthodox Jew, and you know that he's an Orthodox Jew because he wears a fedora. A man, obviously, uh, wears a fedora. And they have these curls that go down the side of their face. They were all black, and underneath is a white garment with tassels. And there he was in the airport trying to find a space on his own, and he literally had a little black box about the size of one-inch cube, and in the black box is the scripture that I just read to you on parchment, as well as some scriptures from Deuteronomy chapter 13. And it was put on a band, a leather band, and it would be tied literally to his forehead. Put the words of God, tie them to your foreheads, says the scriptures. And then it says, bind them upon your arms. And so he took a leather strap and wrapped it all the way around his arm, not in an inflicting pain kind of way, but as a symbol, as a reminder of the word of God being bound to us. And he did that and wrapped it all the way around his middle finger, the finger of life. And in every room, every, sorry, in every hotel room and every place that we stayed in Israel, the words of God were put in a vessel on the doorpost of every room. And the people of Israel, the Jews, would touch it as they went in and out of the door. And then they began to break up the commands of God into further rules to provide, I think, and we've done this as parents, right? We've done this as parents. We put rules and boundaries into place to keep evil at bay, to keep the world out, to keep them protected, especially our children. But in doing so, what the people of Israel did is they put so many rules in place that they kept everyone else away from the message of God. 613 rules, I've told you that before. One for every letter of the Ten Commandments. 283 of them were positive. 365 of them were negative. And they began to classify these rules into greater commands and lesser commands. They would say, well, some of the commands of God are are obviously more important than others. You see the danger of what's happening all of a sudden? I don't know about you, but my parents did this to me when I was a kid, right? They said, there are some things that you will not do 
And some of you know what they are, right? You are not allowed to go to dances. You're not allowed to drink. You're not allowed to hang out with your friends. You, do, you, you don't do things on Sunday. You don't watch TV on Sunday. You don't play sports. Some of you went through that as a kid. And I did it with my own kids in very different ways. The intent was to keep the world at bay and also to honor the glory of God. But in doing so, we have to be careful that we don't keep the glory of God from flowing through us to the world around us. Shabbat is the Hebrew word for Sabbath. So on Friday night, we were staying in the Hotel Dan in Jerusalem. And uh, unbeknownst to me and and all of the other people in our group, uh, what would happen is that one of the three elevators in the hotel were commandeered for Shabbat. And what would happen was is that each floor, or the, what, the elevator would stop at each floor, the doors would open, and then they would close, and then it would go to the next floor, open and close. And this happened from 6 o'clock Friday night all the way to 6 p.m. the next day, Saturday, Shabbat. Guess where my hotel room was? Right outside the door where this elevator kept going and opening up all night long. Bing, Bing. yes, Exactly. And as I tried to get in the elevator, uh, obviously an Orthodox Jew is standing in there, and he put his hand out and he said, Shabbat, pointing to the other elevators. I'm a Gentile, and he was a Jew. And he was saying to me that I was not allowed to get onto the elevator because I would interfere with his holiness ritual of observing the Sabbath. We went down for dinner that night, and uh, the dinner room was filled with people, but there were no Orthodox Jews. Shabbat, Friday night, dinner, was celebrated to themselves in the basement. They separated themselves from us, Gentiles, so that they would not be unclean. And this is real, devoted, serious holiness rituals. It's intended to holy, to keep the Sabbath day holy. But the rules became such that it kept everyone else from experiencing the glory of God. We even tried to go swimming on Saturday. And the instructions that we got were to go down this lane and walk about a kilometer in the other direction along the beach until you couldn't go any farther. And that's where the Gentiles went swimming. You know, I got a hand to them. They are desperately committed to honoring the Sabbath. And they put rules in place to follow the Sabbath, to observe the Lord's commands. But in doing so, they built walls around themselves and kept the Gentiles at bay. You see the danger? Now, Jesus steps into the picture. Jesus is a rabbi. Jesus is someone who taught in the synagogues. He had disciples like the other rabbis had disciples. He taught in the synagogue that I visited in Capernaum. It was incredible to be able to be in that space and for our leader, a guide, to say, Jesus taught here. He probably stood right over there. I don't know if it's square inch or not, but over here somewhere is where Jesus taught. And he would go from temple to to our synagogue to synagogue, and he would teach in the area. As a matter of fact, he was already teaching in a rabbinic school just over on the other side, which no longer exists. Jesus spoke these words every single day, three times a day. The Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord is one, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Whoa. Jesus adds that very last phrase. So what I want you to do is because these are the words that God gave Moses. And these are the words that Jesus gave us. Guys in the worship team, this is not the moment. It'll come in a minute. What I want you to do is for the reading of the word of God, the very words of God, the very words of Jesus, I would like you to stand and honor the text with me. As we read it together, would you stand? 
one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all of the commandments, which is the most important one? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to them, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. The very words of God. Amen? You may be seated. What's different about what Jesus said here versus what Moses said in the Old Testament? It's that one little phrase. Over the course of this past year, we as a church have moved from discovering God in the fall. We walked through the book of Romans. We talked about how do we share the love of God with people who don't know him. And then in the winter months, we talked about disciplines of the faith, about how we grow in our faith with Jesus Christ. And grow groups have been an integral part of that experience. And now as a church, we are going to move into the next phase of who we are as a church. And that is being a blessing to the community in which we live. Jesus' words here, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, is his way of reminding us that we are not reservoirs of God's love, but we are conduits of that love. I stood on the shore of the Dead Sea. Some of you saw the pictures of me floating in the Dead Sea, which was a weird experience, by the way, bobbing around like a cork in the don't have to put your hands in. You have your feet out of the water and you just float. It's an incredible experience, but the Dead Sea is dead. Nothing living in the Dead Sea. As a matter of fact, the Dead Sea is continuing to decline because all of the fresh water from the rivers and streams or what's called the wadis are being taken to provide fresh water for the people who live there. You can't dump it into the Red Sea because once you dump it in the Red Sea, then you have to go through a whole nother process in order to get fresh water out of it. And so for most of the streams that go into the Dead Sea, they redirect the water. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart. We want to be conduits of God's love. And this is not just the the pumping machine that's in my chest. When the Bible talks about loving God with all your heart, he's saying everything that's in you, your emotions, your passions, your feelings, All of the things that drew you to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that called you and that emotionally you stepped into a relationship with him, put all of your heart in there because you love him. Love him with all your heart and with all your mind. Or sorry, all with all your soul. That's the next one. And your soul is the the vessel that God has given you uh, to provide life and sustenance, to be the real person. Between your heart and your soul, it creates character. It creates your personality. Who you are is defined by your heart and your soul. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and your mind. Being a thinking Christian is not a problem for us. Being a reasoned Christian that thinks through things, that doesn't check their brain at the door, that talks about what God wants us to talk about, and to think things through. God hates a lazy intellect. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your passion and your soul and all your thinking and with all your strength. And obviously, the strength part is your physical body and all that you have been given physically to do, certainly being in certain places, doing certain things, caring for people in special ways. But it's also what you produce. And I'm not talking about what you leave in the toilet. I'm talking about what you produce, the work that you do, the kinds of things that you get involved in. I know, some of you are still catching up on that joke. 
what you produce. Your children are part of this. Your grandchildren, if some of you are lucky enough in this room to have great-grandchildren, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, all that you are, who that you are, the work that you do, the children that you have, love God so much that you are a conduit of his love, not a reservoir. So the night before, uh, George says to us on the bus, he says, tomorrow you need your uh, water clothes. Okay, um, that's all he says. And then he says, oh, by the way, ladies, don't wear white because you're going to get wet. And that may be uncomfortable for you being wet and wearing white. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and uh, so water shoes and wear, uh, wear clothes that you can get wet. All right, so we have no idea what's happening the next day. We get on the bus. We got our water clothes. I, got, I brought shoes along for this specifically just so that we could get wet. And I'm imagining all kinds of things, tramping through some streams, right, going into the Dead Sea because we're still close by. Um, I don't know. Maybe we're going into the Jordan. I hadn't got a clue. Remember, he wouldn't tell us nothing. So we pull into this place, and he gets up in the front of the bus, pulls out the microphone, and says, all right, now empty your pockets. Okay, this is getting weirder, right? No cell phones, no wallets, no tissue in your pockets, no rings, no coins. Take it all out of your pockets, put it in your backpack. It'll be safe here. We're going to lock the bus. Ladies, gentlemen, take off your earrings and your necklaces and your glasses if you can't see without your glasses, they must be strapped to your head. It's getting weirder. <laughs> now we have to go out of the bus, right? Typical George. Uh, as soon as he says that, he says, come, let's go. So we're trying to pull stuff off and trying to put it, pull it out of our pockets. And, and he's already off the bus heading into this, this building. Finally, we're all off the bus. We go follow him in. And then he hands us all a life jacket. He's now wearing a life jacket. This is getting scary. Now I don't have anything to identify myself with, and I have to wear a life jacket. This doesn't sound great. He hands us all a life jacket. We put the life jacket on, and then he hands us a consent form where I have to sign away my rights to sue anybody in case I die. <laughs> that I will not sue them if I break a bone or that I have a concussion or if I die in the process of this event. And I know, right? It's like, boy, I'm so excited now. And George looks at us, and it's, this has been a week and a half, right? You, you put your trust in this man. You, you followed him. He's taken us through these amazing experiences. One gift after another, he has provided, you know, opened these gifts for us. And we're at the point now where you either trust this man or you don't. And so 40 of us follow George into this river. Now, in Jordan, where this place was, uh, it's not called a river so much as a wadi. A wadi is a place where all the water gathers when it rains. Please imagine. It's hard to imagine because I couldn't comprehend it myself until I was there. But just imagine the dark, uh, not the dark, the, the dirt is gone. It's all rock. There is no deposits of dirt in any place except in the cracks where the rocks are. And if it rains, there's nowhere for the rain to go. There's nowhere for it to go. It just comes off the side of the mountains, and any rain that comes flows into these wadis. Our guide told us that more people drown in a wadi in the desert than they do of dehydration. Why? Because when the rains come, all that water fast moves into the wadi. And literally, a wall of water can come washing down that ravine. So there's water in this wadi. And we jump in uh, the Arnon River, it was called. It's the natural boundary between the Ammonites and the Jebusites. Uh, a crack in the earth happens and pulls it apart. It's 20 feet wide at some spots and 10 feet wide at others. But literally, there's a 200-foot cliff on either side. It's beautiful, just beautiful. We jump into the water, and immediately we're up here in, 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 in the river, and we notice that only 35 feet down is uh, the highway and 100 feet is the Dead Sea. But all the water stops at about 30 feet away. They've taken all the water and redirected it for the use of the city. So now we're going upstream on the Arnon. Before we go any farther, George stands us all in the water and he says to us, how many came out of Israel? 
Anybody? How many came out of Israel? Pardon me? All of them. How many came out of Israel? No, no. You, you have to say this, okay? Say this out loud with me. How many came out of Israel? All of them. You guys are really bad at this. Come on. All I want you to do is to repeat this phrase. How many came out of Israel? All of them. Say it again with me. How many came out of Israel? All of them. Yes, now I got you. And how many are going to come out of the Arnon, he says to us? All of us. All of us. And he looks at us and he says, this is not about you. This is about you working together with each one of you to make sure that we all come out of the Arnon together. Oh, I got goosebumps just thinking about that moment. Who came out of Israel? All of them. Who's going to come out of the Arnon? All of us. And then we head upstream. Now, 40 of us are helping each other do that. Men and women who sit behind desks all day long. Some of them who have extraordinarily uh, strong and others who need a lot of help. And we probably went up about 800 feet over the course of this hour-long walk in the river. And we have to climb up rocks and boulders. There are ropes, ladders that we have to climb. And along the way, uh, people are placed in order to help the others get up to the upper areas. We're often climbing 10 or 15 feet at a time as the water is now coming and washing over us. Some of the ladies had slipped and there was bashed elbows and bleeding. One lady had a, 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 a bloody nose. It's slippery and it's wet. And this rushing water that's coming down, they are, they are not. And we finally make it all the way to the top and we come up to this waterfall. And the waterfall is, 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 you've probably been at a waterfall like this, but after working at this for an hour and a half, it was beautiful and it was powerful and it was intimidating all at the same time. Because 12 feet wide, a foot deep, water's coming over to the top and crashing into a basin from 20 feet in the air into this basin right in front of the waterfall. And we're standing in front of it and you can barely hear each other speak because the noise is so loud from the water. And George jumps into the water. Now you have to understand something. When that much water hits a basin, it pushes everything out to the side because this basin is now designed to move everything out of the way because the water's coming straight down. George gets into the water, jumps into the middle, and immediately is pushed up to the outside of the basin or the rock wall. And we now have to hold ourselves from the outside edge of the rock wall because of the pressure of the water trying to squish us even in life jackets. And one by one, we all jump into the basin and we go along the outside of the wall until we get to that spot where the water comes over. And you're not even three feet away at that point and the water is so loud, you can't hear anything else but the water. And there's so much water coming down, even though you're not under the water yet, that you feel like you're actually underwater because all of the splashing is now coming over top of you and you're hardly able to breathe. And George goes under the waterfall. And so we follow the rabbi. We're going to follow the rabbi. And one by one, we manage to all get underneath the waterfall. And there in behind the water is this cavern, probably 18 feet wide, 10 feet deep, filled with rocks all in this space. And 40 of us are now crammed underneath the waterfall. And George stands up, and the water's crashing now over top of him, a foot away, and he's drenched with water, and we're all drenched with water, and we're panting, we're exerting ourselves, and we stand in this space, and he says to us at the top of his voice, and I don't want to shout at you because I would hurt your ears, but he needed to in order to be heard. He said, you think you know the love of God. You think you know what it is to drink from living waters. This is the love of God. The love of God is powerful. The love of God is overwhelming. 
The glove of God is drenching. You cannot take it all in. You will be overwhelmed by the love of God when you understand the love of God. It's not something you can go to once and sip and put the cup back. God's love is like a waterfall, and it covers you, and it's powerful, and it moves you. And and we're we're, we're just weeping. And our tears are adding to the pool of water in this place. We're just overwhelmed by the sense of the power of the love of God. And then George turns around and jumps through the waterfall. (laughs) And we're all going, follow the rabbi. And one by one, we get up and we jump through the waterfall. Now you have to, just remember, a foot of water is coming over this, 12 feet wide, into the basin, pushing us out to the side. When you jump through the waterfall, you're not all the way through. You are now in the middle of the drenching, in the middle of the powerful moving of this water. And physically, I'm 220 pounds, wearing a life jacket, and I'm now four feet under the water because of the weight of the water coming down. And in that moment, I'm wondering if I'm going to make it. I'm wondering if I'm going to be able to get up and out and get some air. And when I finally reach the surface and swim like crazy, the 15 feet I need to get to the edge and come out of the water, I'm just overwhelmed with this realization that that's the kind of love that God has for me. That's the kind of love that he says, when I love you with an everlasting love, it is living water. It is water that overflows like a waterfall. That my sins are forgiven and that he loves me so much that he's willing to pour out that much love for me. And it just wrecked me. I jumped right back in. (laughs) It was awesome. And it was powerful and it was painful. And it was so moving. Because Jesus says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one, the Lord is God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and your mind and your strength. And that's the kind of love that I want you to share with your neighbor. That's the kind of love that we're supposed to share with the people around us. That's how they'll know Jesus' love. Because you've experienced the love of God. The overwhelming, unbelievable, drenching, powerful, incredible love of God. He's washed away your sins, made you clean, dunked you under the water and held me long enough there that I came out knowing the powerful love of God. So I want you to stand with me once more. I want you to stand with me. And I want you to say these words with me. And I don't want you to say them because you know them from heart. I don't want you to say them because they're on the screen. Because I hate it when congregations stand and repeat words. You never hear us do it here at Discovery Church because I think it sounds like the Borg in Star Trek. For those of you Trekkies, you in the room, you got the reference. I want you to say these words, not because they're just written in the scriptures, but they are the very words of God. And they're intended for you to say them to each other. I want you to look at your children when you say these words, if they're here with you today. I want you to look at your spouse and the people around you. I want these words to be the encouragement to them that they need to hear. Hear. Not just the words that I'm saying, not just the words of the text, not just to understand, but to be transformed by them. Let them imprint themselves on your soul. Say these words with me. Hear, O discovery, the Lord our God, the Lord is, oh, hang on a minute, hang on a second, hang on. You are not enthusiastic enough about this. Hero Discovery. I put that up there. You are not Israel, you are Discovery. 
you are saying this to the people around you. I need you to say it with a little bit of effort and gusto. I want you to say it with, with passion and meaning that this is not about setting boundaries around the holiness of God, but allowing the love of God to use us to be conduits of the grace of God, that we're not reservoirs, we're rivers of water. Can you say this to the people around you, your spouse, your children, to the person next to you? Can you say it with feeling and passion? Here we go. Hear, O discovery, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no command greater than these. Amen? Amen. Amen.